Okay, my outstanding friends, let's just start with this. The LHC, Large Hadron Collider, as a photon collider. <laughs> this is CERN. Well, they don't use photons, they use protons. And here's what happens with protons. They have a hundred billion particles smashing together in two bunches, smashing head on, and then they look through the debris. I don't think that's the best way to do it. Okay, let me just explain to you. We found the muons that they're looking for. This muon G-2 experiment was to find these muons and, and see how they react with other matter. We did that quite well. Okay, this right here, my friends, is a muon, and that's an electron neutrino. Muon neutrino, electron neutrino. Here they are attached together, side by side, it's called two Dirac neutrinos. The Dirac means when they add it together. Dirac neutrinos. When they together, two of them just like bar magnets, they become a photon. One glows. You can get both bigger and smaller. The other one is always the same size, and it's just like a bowling ball. This is just like a, a big balloon. Boom, boom. It's the energetic part. That's just slams stuff and gets it out of the way. We have created these particles, as you saw. There they are right there. This is a particle. Same particles that Don Lincoln at Fermilab show. Whoops. If we can create those, which we did, we did exactly what they were trying to do. And here is it right here. It says... Muon neutrino is a black ball. Electron neutrino is a white ball. When they hit some medium, which is usually heavy water, the black one just keeps going. The white ones turn into showers. There it is. These are all the black ones. And the white ones are the only thing that can get through our Venturi. What we did was we created a, a smasher, but it's a sideways smasher. They're trying to go head on and hit them, and they're just going this way and that way, and, oh, and they go around each other, and they, they, they don't hit head on almost ever. We have them, so they can't stop. They have to come through that <laughs> venturi. They can't get back out. So they, it's what it is, is the fields crush. It's, it's the particle. They call it particle wave duality. Well, the particle has a field around it, so it has to create a wave. I'll show you that one, too. All right, everything there is, has, is made of particles that have magnetic fields around them. That's a photon. As it passes through the air, the field is way out here. It's just like a bubble around it, a magnetic field. It has to push all the other particles out here that also have magnetic particles. They're all made of the same thing, exactly. So the glowy parts will push the other glowy parts. This creates the wave. And these are all the particles that are being excited, and that's the wave. That's just normal light. Now, we could accelerate that, and that's when we split these particles and broke them into separate particles. The black ones went one way, the white ones went the other way. Okay, like I say, we did much better research than they did, and we just used light. We used pulse lasers. They create the field. They have the particles. This is what the nucleus of an atom looks like, or a proton. This is what a proton looks like. It's not just like this, one big positive. It's 1823 of these Dirac neutrinos, which is the white ball, and a, I mean a black and a white ball together. And then two of those back to back make a photon. Now, when you take these huge protons, that are 1,823 of these at once, and they hit them head on, they just go flying everywhere. It's just a bunch of particle debris. We are sending them through here, absolutely just dividing the black. You stay here. The white you can get through because you can get squishy and power puffy and all that, and the white just takes off by itself. They come back together here. This is, a, this is what this is, in electron neutrinos. They turn into electron showers. The black ones don't change. They just stay the same thing, and they're black over here, just like over there. And, they, and, and, and I'm going to tell you right now, they make up the core of all atoms, even of all protons. The black ones will try to go into the center, and the white ones will always crust. That's why we've never seen the dark matter. I'm not kidding you. It's because the white ones bounce back light. They're bouncers. They're just bouncers. The black ones say, no, 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 everybody come to me. You come to me, come to me, come to me, and they just 
collect around the core. And the bow, other ones bounce back, so we never see the inside. The only time you see these black ones is we, we saw them, and the only reason you see them is because they're on top of the white ones. This black one's in here somewhere, I'm sure. But unless they're, well, you can see them, they're just barely into the white right here. You have to, they're everywhere. They, this dark matter is everywhere. It's not just here. It's in every particle there is. However, it seems to be very dense in the, the core of the Earth. And there may be literally a black hole in the center of the Earth that is nothing but this dark matter. They say, oh, no, 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 it's, it's uh, iron, iron core, and it's going to flip, and it's going to do all these things. I've been look, watching all the latest on it. They have absolutely no idea. No idea what's there. It's supposed to have been spinning like crazy, creating our magnetic field. That's not it. The planet's spinning through all the particles in space, which is the quantum foam, as they say at Fermilab. That's what creates our magnetic field. All right, this is from back in 2015, I believe it was. The Russians put charged particles into a vacuum chamber in zero gravity in space. And this is what happened. They created a black hole. And from the sun and from every luminous body, you are going to transmit all kinds of particles. There'll be just white ones. There'll be just black ones. There'll be black and white ones together. There'll be blobs of little pieces like sand and all kinds of stuff. It's called the solar wind. Now, depending upon it, how it reattaches to itself, my feeling right now is that the black wants to touch other blacks. The whites hate everybody except the black. They want it to be attached back to the black. But well, white against the white, forget about it. They push each other away. That's their nature, is to, is to push. So when they hit, they bounce. And that's what you bring back to you as light. So as the, the glowy part, whatever it is, how energetic it is, I don't care, blue, green, red, pink, orange, bam, it bounces back at a certain frequency. And that's what you see. But it has to hit other white ones. And the other white ones are always surrounding the black. Now, we're seeing this as a flat plane, and I, I, I'm not, I have a hard time explaining that, to be perfectly honest with you. I would think you'd see it as a ball, but it might have something to do with the lighting, because the lighting is also affecting, they don't realize the light is nothing more than these same particles, only they're moving. Everything's made of the same particles. These may be bigger in chunks, you know, a lot more of them attached together at the same time than light, but they're still made of the same particles that light's made of. All right, so at least that should give you an understanding of where I'm going from here. At this point, we got some issues to deal with in uh, physics and science in general, and li literally everything that we've been taught has to be re-examined. So much has changed. Okay, here's the physics case for studying photon collisions, precisely what we do. And the only reason that, that they you make a collision is because their fields interact. We crush the fields. It says the physics of photon collisions has been a topic of some interest for many decades. This goes back long, long ago. It says a special meeting in 1978 discussed the prospect of such collisions. The LHC's at uh, this LEP, the LHC's predecessor, the one it was before, which collided electrons with positrons. Now, I really have never looked into the LEP, but it's, it doesn't matter. Photons are photons; they're the tiniest bits of particles of light, and they're looking for quadratic coupling, which is there's all kinds of things here. The collisions are very clean, as I show you as we're colliding photons, which are elementary particles and not composed of ones like protons. Hundreds of billions of them, they just get debris. Anyway, so they, but it never materialized. They talked about doing it over and over and over, but then they built a large Hadron Collider and the CERN and all that stuff, sent hundreds of billions of dollars, and now they're stuck in that mode. Looks like to me, because I'm showing what, exactly what they want, and I'm getting a refusal to engage. It's not right. Okay, so you saw that CERN wanted to do photons and not protons. Well, 
almost 50 years ago. And I was involved in all of this stuff, not with these people, but marginally, let's put it that way. I was in the Army, I was in uh, nuclear, you know, in um, Nike Hercules missiles, not in the atomic part of it, but uh, in the support realm. And uh, But I took a big interest in it, and I just kept going after that. When I went to college, I got deep into chemistry and physics and all that stuff. And I had an extremely high GT score in 1968, my G, which is GT means general technical, was uh, 139, which was... Uh, was very, very high. <laughs> 136, I think they consider you a 98 percentile. So 139, if you do the math, I was over 100 <laughs> percent. Okay, I just made a claim. I'm going to stand behind it. It's true. Look, there's my GT. You see this? 139. All right, this is when I first got, I got out of the Army. It was the 11th of February, 1970. I was in from 68 to 70. I volunteered for the draft. I let them do anything they wanted with me and they, they took pretty good care of me. <laughs> I came out as an E5. Actually I made E5, Spec 5, seven months after going in. The data rank, I don't even know if they show it here, but anyway. Um, this is what the GT means, Army General Classical. Tech. It's what is its general technical abilities. Has a long history, runs parallel with research, which I love, means for attempting the assessment of intelligence or other abilities. A composite score derived from elements of the Army ASVAB is called general technical. That's the GT. If you scored 136 or higher, before 1980, Mensa will accept the result as proof of being in the 98th percentile. Mine was 139. All right, so you do the math, I'm over 100. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, my friends, I couldn't help myself. I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm making these crazy claims, but it's not like Santos. I have the evidence to prove it. <laughs>